Since gaining independence in 1804, the former French colony has been mired in poverty, crushing debt, violence and political upheaval. The island that Haiti shares with the Dominican Republic was visited by Columbus in 1492. He called it Hispaniola, claiming it for Spain. But Haiti eventually became a fabulously rich French colony, its plantations producing much of the world's coffee and sugar. In 1791, the enslaved Africans who worked those plantations revolted. What followed was a 13-year bloodbath. Then, on January 1, 1804, Haiti traded the French flag for its own. It became the first black republic, and abolished slavery. But in 1825, the French came back, with gunboats, and an outrageous demand, reparations. Haiti had to borrow the money, with interest, from France. Instead of building roads and schools and hospitals, Haiti was paying off that debt until 1947. The first nation forged by rebellion of enslaved people, Haiti in the 19th century struggled for decades under debt to France, coerced into paying reparations to former enslavers. The indemnity was an economic drain on the country, which remains impoverished even today. The United States invaded Haiti in the early 20th century, imposing a system of forced labor. In the past 40 years, an era that began with a popular uprising that ended decades of dictatorship, the country has been beset by compounding crises coups, violence, economic hardship and natural disasters, atop a history of botched or repressive interventions, imperialism and international exploitation. Jean-Claude Baby Doc Duvalier was the only son of François Papa Doc Duvalier, the physician who was elected president of Haiti in 1957. Initially supported by the United States, Papa Doc held on to office for years, stealing millions of dollars in public money and international aid, while ruling through sham elections and fear. When Jean-Claude, 19, came to power upon his father's death in 1971, many hoped he would use a lighter hand. He chose the opposite course. He leaned heavily on his father's shadowy Taunton Makuta paramilitary force named for the Haitian child-stealing boogeyman Uncle Knapsack to terrorize the people into silence. Rampant corruption, violence and killings continued. In the 1980s, as the increasingly dysfunctional country sank into economic turmoil, Baby Doc faced growing opposition at home and abroad. He fled the country in 1986 on a U.S. Air Force plane his Louis Vuitton luggage allegedly stuffed with $120 million in cash to exile on the French Riviera. While his father François Duvalier was in power a group of young Haitians form a group to overthrow him. The group was called Jeune Haiti, which means Young Haiti. The group consisted of Max Armand, his brother Jacques Armand, Gerald Marie Breer, Michael Chandler, Louis Drouin, Charles Forbin, Jean Jurds, Reginald Jourdan, Yvonne Larac, Marcel Nama, Roland Rigaud, Guzelva Drouin and Jacques Y. Desrunt. Several of the group were from the town of Jeremy and the regime ordered reprisals against their family members. Between August and October 1964 at least 27 people ranging from 2 to 85 years old were murdered in a massacre called the J. Ramey Vespers. The true number of people murdered in the J. Ramey Vespers may be in the hundreds. Many others were not killed, but were imprisoned, raped, tortured and expelled from the region. Several local families, including the San Sirik and Ruin families, were wiped out. Although the force consisted of only 13 fighters, they had some military success and were initially seen by the regime as posing a real threat. The year 1964 was a dark year for many families in Haiti. A group of 13 young people, who had been exiled, 
formed a coalition to overthrow Duvalier in an invasion. The men had remained friends when they had both moved to New York in the 1950s, after Francois Duvalier came to power. There they had joined a group called Jeune Haiti, or Young Haiti, and were two of 13 Haitians who left the United States for Haiti in 1964 to engage in a guerrilla war that they hoped would eventually topple the Duvalier dictatorship. The men of Jun Haiti spent three months fighting in the hills and mountains of southern Haiti and eventually most of them died in battle. Louis Drouin was wounded in battle and asked his friends to leave him behind in the woods. Shortly after the landing, Ivan Larac was shot and killed in the area of Combelan, near the town of Jeremy, which Jun Haiti was attempting to reach. The regime placed his body on public display for several days on a major port au Prince Street, accompanied by the sign Welcome to Haiti. On September 8, Gerald Barrier the head of the group, Charles Alfred Forbin and Jacques Way Destrant were killed at Dallas in a firefight against the USMC trained Batalon Tactique. On September 14, Jacques and Max Armand were killed at Pic Formand. On September 27, Marcel Nama was arrested at the Coteau Public Market where he had come disguised as a peasant, to buy food for his comrades. On September 29, at Martinet, Jean Gerdes and Mirko Chandler were wounded in battle. Chandler reportedly asked Jordan, his best friend, to kill him, while Gerdes committed suicide. After months of attempting to capture the men of Jun Haiti and after imprisoning and murdering hundreds of their relatives, Papa Doc Duvalier wanted to make a spectacle of Nima and Drouin's deaths. When Papa Doc declared a national holiday, closed the schools, and brought the children out to watch the execution, the president wanted his Natan school children to watch the execution. So on November 12, 1964, Two pine poles are erected outside the National Cemetery. A captive audience is gathered. Radio, print, and television journalists are summoned. Nima and Ruin are dressed in what on old black and white films seems to be the clothes in which they had been captured khakis for Ruin and a modest white shirt and denim looking pants for Nima. They are both marched from the edge of the crowd toward the poles. Their hands are tied behind their backs by two of Duvalier's private henchmen, Taunton McCoots in dark glasses and civilian dress. The Taunton McCoots then tie the ropes around the men's biceps to bind them to the poles and keep them upright. Nama, the taller and thinner of the two, stands erect, in perfect profile, barely leaning against the square piece of wood behind him. Ruin who wears brow line eyeglasses, looks down into the film camera that is taping his final moments. Bruin looks as though he is fighting back tears as he stands there, strapped to the pole, slightly slanted. Bruin's arms are shorter than Nima's and the rope appears looser on Bruin. While Nima looks straight ahead, Bruin pushes his head back now and then to rest it on the pole. A young white priest in a long robe walks out of the crowd with a prayer book in his hands. It seems that he is the person everyone has been waiting for. The priest says a few words to Druin, who slides his body upward in a defiant pose. Druin motions with his head toward his friend. The priest spends a little more time with Nima, who bobs his head as the priest speaks. If this is Nima's extreme unction, it is an abridged version. The firing squad, seven helmeted men in khaki military uniforms, stretch out their hands on either side of their bodies. They touch each other's shoulders to position and space themselves. The police and army move the crowd back, perhaps to keep them from being hit by ricocheted bullets. The members of the firing squad pick up their Springfield rifles load their ammunition, and then place their weapons on their shoulders. Off-screen someone probably shouts, fire, and they do. 
Mama and Ruin's heads slump sideways at the same time, showing that the shots have hit home. When the men's bodies slide down the poles, Mama's arms end up slightly above his shoulders and Ruin's below his. Their heads return to an upright position above their kneeling bodies, until a soldier in camouflage walks over and delivers the final coup de grace after which their heads slump forward and their bodies slide further toward the bottom of the pole. Blood spills out of Mama's mouth. Ruin's glasses fall to the ground, pieces of blood and brain tissue clouding the cracked lenses. This was indeed a gruesome incident to watch, for everybody especially school children. Thank you for watching Death Row.